The following recording is a program of the World War I Historical Association. This special ongoing series commemorates the centennial of the First World War. This is Dana Lombardi. On September 20th, 2014, the Florida and Gulf Coast chapter of the World War I Historical Association held a seminar with the co-sponsorship of the Public Library of Foley, Alabama. Six noted scholars gave presentations under the theme 1914 Europe Goes to War. These presentations are presented here in six videos recorded at the event. Versailles for Italy is a shameful, mutilated piece. Romania blackmailed both sides successfully, got the biggest awards, it was a disaster militarily and lost, and yet was a big winner at Versailles coming back through the triumph of diplomacy. And the man who engineered that was uh, Jan Bracciano, who we'll see in our talk today. I'm going to start out the rather exotic Pelish Palace, the summer home of the Romanian monarchs and the Transylvanian Alps. And we're going to start out on 3rd of August, 1914, when the war was breaking out and they had a Crown Council Thank making you. a decision whether to enter the war or not. So across Europe, the fighting had started. In the major capitals, the politicians had exhausted all their efforts. The military commanders had taken charge. Millions of men had departed for the garrison, from their garrisons, drew their equipment, and were marching to the rail depots to await the trains that would speed them to their deaths. Ironically, however, in the corner of Europe where the conflagration began, the Balkans, not all had taken sides. And for Romania, the largest and the most populous, the moment of truth had arrived. On the 3rd of August, King Carol I convened a crown council. Government ministers and senior leaders of the nation's political parties gathered in the concert hall of the king's summer residence here at the Pelish Palace in Sinaia. And the political stakes and the drama were high. The central powers expected Romania to join them. In fact, they had treaties, which Romania had promised to do so. Their ambassadors had called in the promissory notes when it became clear the conflict had spread beyond just a local one between Austria and Serbia. However, the same treaties were largely unknown to Romania's ministers, who in the constitutional monarchy determined the nation's policies. The Prime Minister, Ion Bratianu, was openly sympathetic to the Entente, believing that an Entente victory would likely open the door for territorial adjustments favoring Romania. Entente leaders had already offered glimpses of what might come for Romania to join them. Dressed formally, as the occasion warranted, in the concert hall at Sinaia, the ministers and statesmen entered the conference room at 5 p.m. The king alone waited them in uniform and outside Europe and Romania waited. Now the outbreak of the war had placed Romania in a cruel dilemma, although it was one of her own making. She had secretly belonged to the Triple Alliance between Austria, Hungary, and Italy since 1883. Initially, the decision to join the Triple Alliance had seemed wise. Romania had allied with Russia in the Russo-Turkish War of 1878-77 which had led to great military success as the Russians pressed south towards Istanbul. And alarmed by the specter of Russia determining the fate of the sick man of Europe, the English had initiated an international conference at Berlin that stripped Russia of most of her gains. In the same phase, Russia turned on her ally and took Bessarabia from Romania. It had to have something to show the Russian people. Angered yet fearful of Russia, Romania then secretly joined the Triple Alliance in 1881. And dynastic ties helped firm up the alliance, since King Carol I of Romania was really a German, born prince of the Hohenzollern Sigmaringen family, as such a cousin to Kaiser Wilhelm II. Over time, however, the arrangements with the Triple Alliance had lost its luster. 
And that's uh, Carol there, a uh, picture taken when he was a relatively young man, and he's wearing a Prussian Pour Le Marit medal around his neck. All right, over time, however, the arrangement with the Triple Alliance had lost its luster. In the insurmountable obstacle, the smooth relations with Austria-Hungary lay northwest of Romania in the Hungarian province of Transylvania. It's their little red circle. Uh, the majority of the inhabitants of Transylvania, and this is an ethnic map, and the blue are the Romanians, were uh, the majority of the, Roman uh, the inhabitants in Transylvania were Romanians. And the Hungarian yoke rested hard on their shoulders. They were treated as serfs. They naturally looked to Bucharest for succor. In an era of growing nationalism, Transylvania became Romania irredenta. Initially, the Romanians had recognized that military action against Austria-Hungary had zero chance of success. And they wanted good relations with their large neighbor to the north as a counterweight against Russia. This left them little choice but to place their hope in diplomacy in order to alleviate the situation of their compatriots living under the Hungarian rule. But these efforts floundered against the implacable opposition of the Magyar rulers of Hungary. The black beasts of Romanians took the form of Count Stephen or Istvan Tisa. Uh, let's see if I can find Count Tisa. Here we go. He was the larger than life Prime Minister of Hungary from 1903 to 1905, and again from 1913 to 1917. Tisa had made it clear that voluntary secession or cession of Hungarian territory or widening of the franchise restricted to favor of the top 10% of the Magyars was out of the question, and whoever attempted to seize even one square meter of Hungarian soil would be shot. It was not an idle threat. He was a violent, contentious man with a sandpaper personality. He had a well-deserved reputation as one of the most formidable duelists in Europe. In the first week of January 1913 alone, while president of the lower house of Hungary, parliament, he had called out two political opponents where Sabre was the weapon, and he won both duels. King Carol's suspicion and fear of Russia nonetheless outweighed his anger with the Hungarians and his concern over the treatment in Transylvania. So Romania remained pledged to the Triple Alliance at least in theory, since the king hid the treaty from his council. And his cabinet, whose ratification was required to make it binding, and he doubted their approval, so he hid the treaty from them. <laughs> its existence was nonetheless something of an open secret. And in fact, in reality, no government in Bucharest could overlook what was happening in Hungary to the treatment of the Romanians there. So the relations between Austria, Hungary, and Romania were gradually growing sour, and they had actually become quite strained over the volatile issue of the treatment of the Hungarians. Moreover, the tide of Romania's loyalty to the Triple Alliance began to ebb fast after the two Balkan Wars of 1912-13. They served to illustrate the resurgence of Russia and the weakness of the dual monarchy. Romania saw her position as the preeminent Balkan power threatened. A younger generation, therefore, of Romanian politicians, most of whom were educated in France, and particularly those in the National Liberal Party, headed by Ion Bratianu, who you see in the picture there, had begun to think that Romania's interests could be best served outside the Triple Alliance. This was an idea welcomed by the new Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Sazanov. Uh, at the end of July, in 1914, as the crisis caused by the assassination of Franz Ferdinand came to a head, the Austrian government sought reassurances from Romania. When Austrian Ambassador Otto Karczernan read the text of the Austrian ultimatum of Serbia to King Carol, poor King Carol turned pale and cried, that means war, world war. His heart, soul, and word of honor lay with Austria and Germany, but he knew that most of his subjects and his ministers favored the Entente cause. The impossibility of the situation be clean, quite clear to him at that point. Austria's Foreign Minister Berkold told her Ambassador Chernin on the 26th of July to advise King Carol that Serbia had rejected the ultimatum and war was likely. <coughs> Austria hoped the conflict could remain localized, in which case she expected Romania to observe neutrality. On the other hand, Chernin was told to tell King Carol that if Russia moved aggressively against us, we are counting on the loyal cooperation of Romania as our ally. And when it became clear that the conflict indeed had widened beyond Serbia and Austria, Franz Josef sent a letter to King Carol advising him of the impending declaration of war. 
Germany and Russia entered the struggle on the 1st of August. Kaiser Wilhelm upped the ante, appealing to Carroll as a Hohenzollern prince to march alongside the two central powers, calling Romania the bulwark in the east against Slavic hordes. William added, I am confident you will be loyal as a king and as a Hohenzollern to your friends, and you will respond to the obligations of the Triple Alliance without any reservations. Franz Joseph likewise added to the king, uh, referred to the king's duty as an officer, and I quote, to fight shoulder to shoulder against Russia, whose aims for a Balkan hegemony, hegemony could hardly or could only lead to Romania's uh, destruction. So the denouement of the crisis came at the Crown Council on the 3rd of August, the Pelish Palace. Up to this point, Romania had taken no steps whatsoever of military nature. But prior to sounding out the cabinet on the 3rd of August, the day before, King Carroll decided to work on his own family, see how things stood there. And the royal family was deeply divided. In addition to his German heritage and the experience of being left in the lurch by Russia 30 years before, King Carroll held the belief that England would never enter the war, leaving the outcome tilted to the central powers. Queen Elizabeth, who you see here, um, she was born a princess of Vied in Germany also, and she was quite popular in Romania. She authored books under the name Carmen Silva in French, Romanian, uh, German, and one other language, uh, can't remember which. Uh, and she followed her husband's inclinations, namely to support the central powers. But she was far more strident. Auntie wrote her niece, Crown Princess Marie, suddenly found herself the Rhine Tochter, and with a vengeance, it was all the time Deutschland über alles, Gottfried uns, and all the rest of it. And as you can see, by the time uh, the war came, the Queen was looking rather more formidable. King's nephew and the Crown Prince, Ferdinand, born in Germany also, and favoring the central powers like his uncle, sat mute, fearful of crossing his outspoken and headstrong wife. And his wife was Crown Princess Marie. She was granddaughter of both Queen Victoria and Tsar Alexander II, and she did not hide her sympathy for the Entente. And she assured King Carroll that England would enter the war with France and Russia. Well, trying to verify this assertion, the king summoned a politician named Taki Ionescu to a luncheon on the 2nd of August. Ionescu was the leader of the Conservative Democratic Party, former cabinet minister, and he leaned towards the Entente, although he publicly espoused neutrality. He had just returned from a vacation in England with his English wife. He had good connections in London, where he moved in important circles. So at the luncheon, the king, and the, especially the queen, expressed their support for Germany and Austria in the coming conflict. And prompted by the crown princess, Ionescu told the queen that England, as she had against Napoleon, would go into the war with her last man and her last shilling. So the next day, they met in the Pelish Palace. At the Crown Council, in accordance with custom, the king spoke first. The contest, he said, already underway, would lead to a new map of Europe. He advocated honoring the treaty with Austria. His words fell flat, and a profound silence descended over the group. The king turned to Bracciano, but the Prime Minister begged off, asserting his right to speak last and indicating the senior opposition leader should instead uh, express his views. And that task fell to a gentleman named Theodore Rossetti at 77, Romania's oldest living former prime minister. He spoke in favor of neutrality, arguing that Romania had no obligation to join Austria. Only elderly Peter Karp, the former head of the Conservative Party and the most outspoken Germanophile in the group, supported the monarch. He supported or he forwarded two arguments against neutrality. First, he said, from a simple moral standpoint, a commitment had been made and must be kept. Treaty. Second, he expressed his belief that the central powers would prevail. Karp's eloquence had made a strong impression, especially the words concerning honoring obligations. But a gentleman named Alexander Marshall Oman, Conservative Party leader, asked King Carroll to read aloud the appropriate section of the treaty. King complied. If Austria were attacked by one of the states bordering Romania, that nation had to help. Our allies, Marjolo observed, have not been attacked. They have initiated the attack, therefore, we have no obligation. <laughs> the remainder of the ministers and party, leader, party leaders expressed their support for neutrality. 
Prime Minister Bracciano speaking last and stating the position of the government likewise recommended neutrality, noting that the question of Romanians in Transylvania dominated the entire picture. He concluded by noting that the war will last a long time. Let us pay attention to the unfolding of events, and we shall have the occasion to speak our mind. Okay, now he's on the cover of Time magazine. Although that didn't appear in 1927, because Time hadn't found it in 1923, and that was when he died. All right. When the tally was taken, everyone but Karp supported Bratiano. The king then stated that his constitutional monarchy had no choice but to accept the vote, and he would. He was crushed and died two months later. All right, by remaining neutral while waiting to see which direction the winds of war would blow, Bracciano's policy brought Romania time, time to get the best deal and time to prepare for the war. It was Romania's territorial interests, not any abstract theory of liberty or justice, governed by the prime, uh, prime minister's decision-making process. Her territorial interests were summed up in the term Greater Romania. And for Bratiano, that meant the province of Bessarabia, which had been lost to Russia in 1878. The Bukovina, uh, the duchy of uh, just to the north, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and indeed it was part of the Austrian uh, lands. And finally, Transylvania. That this concept of Greater Romania included territory for which Romania had not the slightest justification didn't trouble him or budge him from his self-appointed task. Bracciano had no choice but to side with the Entente powers because their victory alone could bring him his goals. And he pursued the goal of a Greater Romania with a determination that bordered on obsession, accompanied by ability to drive a bargain that still leaves us gasping. He supported the Entente powers, yet he profoundly distrusted them, especially Russia sharing with his countrymen an unshakable conviction in that country's villainy. The Entente powers were about to discover they would never get from him an ounce of support for anything did not, that did not benefit Romania, no matter how much it might serve the Allied cause. Rom when Romania finally entered the war in August 1916, no one could fault the terms that Romania, that Bratiano had wrought for his country. Now the Prime Minister had actually achieved his first Trump triumph even before the Crown Council met and called for neutrality. This coup came at the end of July, when the major powers were beginning to line up in anticipation of military action. Um, he suggested to the central powers that they could offer proof that they valued Romania's neutrality by promising her the Russian province of uh, Bessarabia, you see on the map here, the land between the Sarath and Dniester rivers and that they should compel the Hungarian uh, kingdom to acknowledge political rights for Romanian subjects in Transylvania. <coughs> it never possessed or never posed any kind of a problem for any of the warring parties to promise the enemy's territory. Giving up their own thing was another matter, and Budapest's refusal to discuss Transylvania became the stumbling block for the central powers. Bratiano received only a pledge for Bessarabia. Wasting no time, he approached Russian Foreign Minister Sazonov, who on the 29th of July told him that Romania would be rewarded for joining the Entente. And the next day, he specifically mentioned Transylvania. And we can see Transylvania there. Bracciano hesitated. And the Russian then said, if you remain neutral, we will give you Transylvania. <laughs> So the wily prime minister now had pledges from both parties for substantial territorial gains, Bessarabia or Transylvania, in return for giving absolutely nothing. He pledged to remain neutral, which meant nothing. And yet he had already received these two territories, depending on who won. As fighting commenced, Austria's military vulnerabilities surfaced rather early, something that did not go unnoticed by the Romanians. They also knew that Austria had no fortifications along her border with Romania. The gendarmerie force of maybe four or five battalions armed with some old rifles scattered along an 800-kilometer mountainous frontier constituted the defense. Transylvania sat ready to be plucked, and the Romanian general staff began work on a campaign plan to seize it. Bracciano moved with great caution, however, seeking to transform the vague promises from the Entente into solemn treaties. First step came with Russia in October 14, 1914 rather, when Sazonov formally acknowledged Romania's right to annex Transylvania and areas of the Bukovina up here to the north 
in return for her neutrality, so he put it in writing. The Russians didn't come away empty-handed, however, because they forced Bratiano to block shipments of arms and ammunition from Germany and Austria to Turkey that were traveling through Romania, and the Romanians were required, or were required to look the other way when weapons from Russia went to Serbia. The military stalemate arrived at the winter of 1914-1915, however, amply justified Romania's neutrality and sobered those who had decried Bratiano's caution. Further justification came with the rollback of the Russians from Poland following the spectacular Austro-German breakthrough at Gorlis Tarno in May of 1915. The Romanian government remained hesitant throughout all of 1915. Sazonov attributed Romania's caution to her fear of backing the wrong horse, but that only partially explained the situation. The Allied failure at Gallipoli had left a terrible impression, as did the immobilization in Greece of the strike force sent to aid the Serbians, the Army of the Orient, an episode which underscored Romania's similar geographic isolation. At the same time, local Romanian businessmen and land magnates had profited immensely from the machinations of both sides to acquire the uh, Romania's treasures of petroleum and agricultural products, and they had no reason to kill the goose that was laying the golden egg. Money rolled in as the merchants gladly took orders from the highest bidders. While so far neutrality had benefited Romania, Bratiano feared it would not deliver any land at the end of the war, in spite of many pledges. The only way Romania could be certain of acquiring Transylvania was to march with the Entente. Bratiano knew this. But he also needed time to improve Romania's dismal preparation for war. And two, he wanted to squeeze every last concession he could from the Entente. So he refused to enter the war without two very specific guarantees. The first was written acceptance of all of Romania's territorial demands by the Entente, and the second was substantial amounts of war materiel. Also, his appetite for land had grown. Let's so get this one going here. Whoops, back up. Um, when the Austrians recaptured Galicia in the summer of 1915, a nervous Russia sought to keep uh, Romania neutral by offering the Bukovina, which was up here to the north, uh, back up here for a second. Yeah. They offered the Bukovina, and Bratiano said, yeah, we'll take the Bukovina, but I'd also like to get the Bonat of Temesvar over here to the left, over here to the west. The problem with that was that uh, that had already been promised to Serbia by the Allies. So Russia balked, but Britain and France forced her to agree secretly, and so the Serbs were left in the lurch, although they didn't know it. By mid-1916, military matters appeared more propitious for Romania, and Bratiano decided early in the summer of 1916 that the time to join the Entente had arrived. The German colossus appeared to be tottering. Their great offensive at Verdun, the first in the West since 1914, had failed. And their hard-pressed divisions were completely tied up, warding off the English on the Somme River and French counterattacks at Verdun. In the East, General Brusilov's offensive had badly shaken the Central Powers, rolling crushed Austro-Hungarian forces back to the eastern edge of the Carpathian Mountains as the Russians retook Galicia and the Bukovina, providing the catalyst that finally stirred Bratiano. The Prime Minister approached the Russians, uh, asked them to send a large force to the Dobruja region that I've got here in the circle along the Black Sea. He reasoned that their presence would protect his southern flank by discouraging the Bulgarians, who were now on the side of the Central Powers, from attacking and permitting <coughs> Romania to devote her entire effort to Transylvania. To accommodate this would request required, uh, would require the Russians to compromise their own campaign plan, plan, plan for an upcoming offensive in Galicia. And the Russians bought their chief of staff, Mikhail Alexeyev, already on record regarding Romania's putative entry and more liability than boom, reiterated the view. No. Undaunted, Bratiano next argued that in advance of the Allied Army of the Orient in Salonika in Greece that you see here in the red circle, up into central Bulgaria, would just as effectively thwart any Bulgarian effort to intervene in the, mobil intervene in the mobilization of his army as would the appearance of the Russians in the Dobruja region. He turned to the French and English, telling him he would enter the war only after they stirred General Maurice Seurat and the Army of the Orient into action. 
British Foreign Office admitted the le legitimacy of this request, but Romania's expectation of action from Salonika from the moribund Sorail was embarrassing, to quote Sir Edward Gray, and in fact the same old story of Romania will only join us when we have won the war. <laughs> Reproaches meant nothing to Bratiano, who continued to press for ammunition in a large Russian or Entente force on his southern border. Prime Minister remained firm, confident that he had the support of the French, who, reeling from Verdun, would bring the Russians around. The French wrote the Tsar. Bracciano kept hammering away for his demands, telling English Ambassador Barclay that the first ammunition ship had to reach Romania before he would budge. He insisted that the Allies launch an offensive from Salonika to pin down the Bulgarians. Finally, Bracciano had the nerve to ask the English ambassador if England would cover the losses Romania could expect when her intervention would terminate her grain contracts with Germany and Austria. <laughs> the English agreed. <laughs> Clerks wrote, wrote it all down in the military and political conventions. Bracciano next announced he would not declare war on Germany, Bulgaria, and Turkey, only Austria-Hungary, and he would not engage in any military action against Germany. He justified this position by pointing out that he was not able to guarantee he could overcome the cabinet's continuing support for neutrality if he asked for a declaration of war against all the central powers, just Austria-Hungary. The Entente powers were enraged, especially Russia, whose intransigence on this issue threatened to undo the whole thing. <laughs> Bratiano waited, gambling that France and England, desperate and hard-pressed on the Somme in the West, would bring the Russians around. The bluff worked. The Russians backed down. By dropping the requirement that Rom Romania initiate hostilities against Germany, Bulgaria, and Turkey, the final shape of the military convention governing Romania's entry emerged. Romania agreed to begin operations against Austria-Hungary ten days after the Allies would launch an offensive from Salonika. In turn, Russia would pledge that she would conduct naval operations against the coast of Romania to block Bulgaria from landing troops there. She also committed to send an army corps of two infantry and one cavalry divisions to the, the, to the Dobruja region, arriving there in the later than one day after Romania mobilized. The Allies also promised mountains of military stores and agreed to send experts to establish ammunition factories. A date was set for signing the convention the 14th of August. That day passed without the convention being signed. Bratiano knew he had the ministers, or at least the majority of them, in his pocket, but he needed a broad consensus and above all the king's assent. Just as it had been inconceivable for the king to have gone to war in 1914 without the cabinet's approval, it was equally unimaginable for Braniano to take the country to war without the king sanctioning it. Taciturn, shy, and indolent, King Ferdinand nonetheless was a Hohenzollern through and through. He had served in the Prussian army, his brothers wore its uniform in the current conflict, and he had an implacable faith in the supremacy of the German military. Bracciano had a powerful ally, however, in the Queen Marie. Her passion for the Allies surpassed that of the Prime Minister, and when the war was proclaimed in Romania in favor of the Entente, noted American Minister Charles Volpica, everyone gave her credit for influencing this decision. Bracciano counted on her to ensure that Ferdinand, who had an obstinate streak, came through at the right moment. In reality, Bratiano already had the king in his pocket, far more than he knew. Like most Romanians, Ferdinand had come to the conclusion, as an English diplomat later explained, that the prime minister would never do anything rash or ill-considered, and that if he entered the war, it would only be because victory was certain. The central powers had recognized that the playing board had tipped against them. Ambassador Chernin informed Vienna that the king did not want war. But if the Prime Minister presented him with a fait accompli, Ferdinand would comply because he was a tool in the hands of Bracciano. The decisive moment came at a Crown Council held late the morning of the 27th of August, 1916. Once again, Bracciano had waited until the last possible moment. The convention he had signed obliged Romania to declare war that day on Austria. He had already written a declaration of war and sent it to his ambassador in Vienna. The council met at Kotrecheni Palace in Bucharest, almost the same cast of ministers, party leaders, and former prime ministers who had attended the fateful Crown Council meeting two years earlier awaited the prime minister and king. Per custom, the king spoke first. Visibly nervous and terribly pale, Ferdinand stated, 
Although I am a member of the Hohenzollern family, I am the king of Romania first, and therefore I have to do what my subjects wish me to do. I perceive that the majority of the people are asking that Romania enter the war on the side of the Entente, and I therefore state to you that I am ready to comply with their wish. He then ruled out any debate and let Bratiano explain the government's decision. The Prime Minister carefully reviewed the treaties he had negotiated with the Allies, predicted the defeat of the Central Powers, and stated that only intervention on behalf of the Entente would guarantee Romania her prizes. A horrified Peter Karp said, I will give you my three sons. I will suspend the publication of my newspaper because I do not wish to occasion further unpleasantness. But as Romania's victory must be Russia's victory, I wish Romania to be beaten. A shock, Bracciano snapped back, then take your sons and give them to the German army. The meeting adjourned without the support of the conservatives, but King Ferdinand had the last word. With God, let us go forward. The government declared martial law that afternoon. The mobilization of the army began and the borders were sealed. In Bucharest, soldiers surrounded the embassies of the central powers and interred the occupants. Later that evening in Vienna, a few minutes after 9 p.m., Romania's ambassador, Edgar Mavrocodato, took the declaration of war from the safe where it had sat for several days and called for the short, his car for the short drive to the Bauhaus plots. He knew the declaration meant no words. Romania sees itself forced to place itself at the side of those who would be able to assure the realization of its national unity. Simultaneously with the presentation of the declaration of war, Romanian soldiers swarmed over the border, overwhelming the surprised Austrian gendarmes.